All right, so we uh, left off. I'm going to use this dot cam a little bit uh, this week. I'm probably at some point kind of ask you guys whether or not you like this a little more than the board. It should be probably kind of similar. Um, also kind of allows me to kind of those videos that I'm getting posted up there. Uh, you have a little more content as we kind of get towards the end of the course. So we left off talking about comparing two population means and building confidence intervals for that true difference is. We then say we can also do hypothesis testing, right? Everything's gonna look exactly the same, except, right? Our, oh, there we go. Our test statistic equation, oh, maybe there we go, All right? Is gonna be a little bit different, right? But in terms of the procedure, everything we're doing is exactly the same as before. So we're gonna just get more practice kind of doing this hypothesis testing. Uh, today, I'll also kind of show you how we start to do some of this in Excel. So we'll kind of throughout the week be covering kind of three different types of examples. Comparing population means when we know the population variance. We started that last week. Comparing population proportions. And then comparing sample means when we only have sample variances, right? And I'll show you kind of along the way how we do each of these in Excel as well. So oh, there we go. The very first problem we'll kind of start working through kind of as our example is think about whether or not tropical storms have kind of increased in more recent years. So we've got an older time period and a newer time period, right? The number of years here will be kind of our sample sizes, right? I've got 22 years of data from the newer years, 32 from kind of these older time period, this older time period. I have the sample mean from both groups and I also have somehow a known population variance. We said this isn't probably very practical, but we have to walk before we can run. So we'll start out with these examples and throughout the week progress to where we only have sample variances, okay? So we're gonna define the difference that we're looking at as the difference between kind of the newer time period, that's our group one, and the older time period. Anytime we're doing these differences and we wanna look at like changes across time, it always makes sense to put the newer time period first, right? And I'll kind of give a little bit of an insight as, as to why here. So there we go. If I'm thinking about this difference, and I think the newer time period ended in 2011, and the older one was maybe, hopefully I'm getting this, this year right, something like it ended in 1989. If we think about setting it up as the newer time period minus the old, we've got different hypothesis that we could do, right? So the first could be that we assume this difference is greater than zero, or think about it as greater than or equal to. So really what we'd be saying here is, is this difference greater than or equal to zero? What that really implies, if I do a little bit of algebra here, and just add that mean from 1989 to both sides, saying that that difference is greater than zero is really saying is 2011, right? The, the, the newer time period greater than the older time period, right? Or if we say, is this greater than zero, we're thinking about have tropical storms kind of increased, right? Has that mean gotten larger? Okay. If we wanted to do that difference being less than or equal to zero, well there, we just write that out, do a little bit of algebra, assuming that it's less than or equal to zero is really the same as saying that they've decreased, right? That that mean is now smaller right, or less than the older time period. And then if we wanted to do, right, assume that it's equal to zero, what we're really saying there is, well, if the difference is equal to zero, what we're really saying is has the, you know, we're assuming that that mean hasn't changed at all, right? Or that's exactly the same in the older time periods as it is in the newer time periods, okay? So, you know, we could do this for any example, right? but this covers all of our bases. We've got left, right, and a two-tailed test here, okay? So we're thinking about coming up with the null and alternative hypothesis, right? For an example like this, if we wanna know whether or not tropical storms have increased, the only way that they've increased, let me see if I can get this down here in the corner so we kind of have it something to compare to. If we're thinking about that difference is greater than zero, that would imply that the newer time period has a higher number of tropical storms than the old, or that storms have increased. So if that's what we want to test for, right? Whatever we want to test for is going to be our alternative hypothesis. 
So in our alternative hypothesis, we're going to say, is that difference greater than zero, right? Or have they increased? The only way that that difference is, you know, if they've increased, the only thing that can be true about that difference is that it's greater than zero, right? Because if they've increased, the mean in 2011 would have to be greater than the mean in that older time period. Let's see if I got, yeah, that ended in 1989. So we've got our alternative hypothesis here. That's what we want to test for. We'll assume the exact opposite is true. So I think I mentioned this at the end of last class, but one nice thing that I'll do with these two population examples is we'll always use this assumed true difference of zero. Now we might do a left, right, or two-tailed test, but the actual value that we'll assume that difference is equal to, or greater than or equal to, or less than or equal to, will always be zero. Okay. So if I go back, kind of looking at that test statistic equation, if that assumed true difference is zero, it makes the numerator a little bit easier, right? Subtracting zero doesn't change anything, so I can kind of ignore that. So here we've got what type of tailed test? Look at the alternative <laughs> hypothesis. I've got a greater than sign, so I've got a greater than or a right tailed test. So when I've got a right tailed test here, and I said I'll always keep that assumed true difference of zero, what I'm really thinking about is all I see is this sample difference or that difference in sample means, right? It was just kind of a different way that we were gonna, gonna write that difference in sample means. We know that sample difference should be normally distributed around whatever the true difference is. Well, here we don't know what the true difference is, but we've assumed it's equal to zero. So one kind of nice thing is, if I ever see a difference in sample means that's positive, right? Or greater than zero. Well, I know that's gonna be a certain number of standard deviations above the assumed true difference. If I ever see, a difference in sample means that's negative, well, I know that that's gonna be a certain number of standard deviations below the assumed true difference. So when I had that test statistic equation for the difference in sample means, looks something like this. Where remember in my denominator, I've always got the standard deviation of whatever statistic I'm looking at. Well, here we said the standard deviation of the difference in sample means was just the square root of each Group's variance divided by that group's sample size, and then add those two together. Okay. So if I've got a standard deviation down here, that's always going to be positive. So whatever the difference in sample means I find is, if it's negative, I end up with a negative test statistic. If it's positive, I end up with a positive test statistic. So if I go back to my example here, I look at the sample mean from the newer time period minus the old. I've got what? Five point eight is the sample difference that I see. So I saw kind of a sample difference of 5.8. So automatically I know my test statistic is gonna be a certain number of standard deviations above that assumed true difference of zero. So I know my test statistic should be positive. So I think I'm gonna skip one here. If I asked you for the test statistic here, we could rule D out right away. Right? Now from there, it's just gonna be a matter of, we've got our equation for the test statistic, it's just a matter of plugging our values in. We've got the um, sample size from the newer years is 22, sample size from the older time period was 32. We've got the population variance given to us for both groups or both time periods. And then we already kind of talked about, we've got the sample means from both time periods as well. So it's just a matter of plugging our values in there. So if we do that, just plugging everything in, that assumed true difference is zero. I said we can almost ignore that because subtracting zero doesn't, doesn't change anything. We're gonna end up with a test statistic of about 4.9. Okay. So what I've really done there, and it doesn't matter if I draw this, I guess, above or below. Usually I draw it below, but we're thinking about what we were doing was turning that sample difference into a Z value, right? So if I did that, and I find that that sample difference corresponds to a Z statistic of what? I think we said 4.90. Then my test statistic, remember this was a right tailed test, would be right here. And the P value is the area that's to the right of my test statistic for right tail test. Or for any test, right, you're kind of more extreme, right? Going into the tail. If I have a left tail test, that means going into the left tail, right tail test going into the right tail. Two tail, we said, well, I could see evidence on either side. Once I find the error in one tail, I then had to remember for a two-tailed test, I multiplied it by two to get the p-value. But here we just got a one-tailed test. So 
I could look up that value of 4.9, and then the area to the right of it will be my p value. Now, if I try to do that, right, I go to my standard normal table. Maybe, here we go. I try to look up 4.9. Well, the highest statistic I can find, oh, sorry. Let me see if we can get this back on here. I don't know why I did that. Let's see if it'll go to my screen now. There we go. So I go to my standard normal table and I try to look up that test statistic of 4.9. It only goes up to 3.9. But if the area or 3.9, keep going here, nine, right? So if the area to the left of 3.99 is basically one, well, then the area to the left of 4.99 is going to be even closer to one, right? So I've got, there we go. This area to the left of my test statistic is going to be approximately one, which means the area to the right or my p-value is going to be approximately what? Yeah, the area under the curve is one, so something just above zero, right? But so close to zero that out to the fourth decimal, I can't even tell a difference from zero, right? So we've got an extremely small p-value here, which kind of makes sense because I saw sample evidence that was almost five standard deviations away from what I assumed to be true. So what that means is, if I saw something that's five standard deviations away from what I assumed to be true, it's probably the case that the actual true difference is going to be something a lot closer to 5.8, right? That sample difference that I found. Okay? So because that is so unlikely for me to see, if in fact that assumed true difference was zero, I'm okay rejecting it. And what we said more specifically, we would compare our p-value to alpha, but a p-value of approximately zero is gonna be less than any alpha that we choose, right? Any level of significance or any level of confidence that we wanna be able to reject this null. Way. So here, I could think about, I'm gonna be able to reject with a p-value of approximately zero. I'm gonna be able to reject, and if we think about the different alphas, they kind of correspond to different significance levels and different confidence levels. Okay. So an alpha of 0.1, well, I'm less than 0.1, so I can reject at the 10% significance level, or think about it as the 90% confidence level. I can reject at an alpha of 0 0.05, right? Zero is less than 0 0.05. So I can reject at the 5% significance level or with 95% confidence. And I'm less than 0 0.01 here as well. So I can reject at the 1% significance level or reject that null with 99% confidence. Okay. Any questions over, over anything there? Remember, we kind of found that p-value was the area to the right for a right-tailed test. We could then make our rejection decisions. <laughs> now, if I had wanted to do the critical value approach, I could have, right? So if I come back here, if I wanted to find the critical values, right, at the, you know, significance levels of 10, 5, and 1%, so that is an alpha of 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01, right? I could look them up in this table, right? The area I want in the tail is 0 0.01, right? So I go look up 0 0.01. Looks like I'm gonna be close to right here. So negative 2.32 and two, negative 2.33. So we'll use the higher of the two, which is 2.33, but it's not negative because I'm dealing with a right tail test, right? So the table tells me the Z value that would give me 0 0.01 in the lower left tail, I actually want to 0 0.01 in that upper right tail. So it's going to be the exact same value, but positive, right? Because we have a symmetric distribution. Now I could use this method and kind of look all three of those alphas up in the table, but probably a nice little shortcut that probably saves me a little bit of time is I can use the last row of that student T table because we said that last row gives us the standard normal values. So here I could say, all right, the three alphas I want, 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.01. So you go down to that last row, 1.282, 1.645, and 2.326, right? I can actually be a little bit more specific. And I can kind of get out to the third decimal there. Right? So with a critical value approach, I always think, you know, the p-value depends on kind of what is easier for you or whatever is easiest for you to think of. 
But with a critical value approach, I'm just going to look up the three Z values that give me. No, this is 0 0.1, sorry. And then the critical value for 0 0.05 and 0 0.01. And then my rejection regions for right tail tests are the area to the right. We just look those up. So 1.282, 1.645, and 2.326. Okay. So now if I've got my reject, or sorry, my critical values and my rejection regions plotted. Now it's just a matter of plotting that test statistic. Okay. So where would 4.9 be? Well, probably somewhere off here on the table, but we can kind of think about it. it's going to be somewhere way over here. Right? So my Z statistic or my test statistic was way over here, clearly in the rejection region at all three levels. So similar to that p-value approach, I'm gonna see here that I can reject at every single significance level, seeing a test statistic that's 4.9 or seeing sample evidence that was almost five standard deviations away from what I assume to be true. Okay. Any questions over anything there? Even if it goes back to the p-value or, or anything that we kind of, So you kind of see once we have that test statistic, it looks very similar to what we were doing before. Now, coming up with the test statistic, we had a few more moving parts, right? We go back. Let me make sure this, okay. We go back here, look at our test statistic equation. We had a few more moving parts, but really once we get that value for our test statistic, everything looks exactly the same as what we we're doing before, okay? Other questions on that? Okay. Um, so this is some kind of moving on to like proportions here. I think instead what we're going to do is I put up this two population HT blank under the in-class data folder on Canvas. <laughs> so I think the complete version is up there as well. We might do a few things in class that look a little different than that completed version and we'll kind of reconstruct it from scratch. So I've got a bunch of different worksheets down here. They're kind of We'll work through, you know, through these throughout the week and probably even to kind of next Monday as well. But let's start out in this Midwest kind of sheet. Right? So I have uh, some data on, kind of, I think, every D1 university, or at least a, a large majority of them. I don't think, sorry, not everyone, but a pretty good amount of the, the D1. Actually, sorry. Looks like it's not just. No, yeah, these are all D1 universities. So we could find kind of the average or the mean enrollment across this, this sample, right? Now, this is going to be a little bit of a goofy one where I said, you know, assume that I gave you some known population variance, right? Where this comes from, I'm not really sure, right? This is, like I said, these are kind of goofy examples. It's more practical. We only have the sample variance. But if it was, was more like some type of production process or something, maybe we know the, the variance on that, on that machine, okay? So let's say we have the population variance. And from our sample, we can come up with a sample mean for this total undergraduate enrollment period. Right? So control shift or command shift on a Mac, enter, we've now got our sample mean. So we're looking at this total undergraduate variable. Right? I can then come up with my sample size using that count function. Right? This is all stuff that we hopefully are we're getting pretty familiar with, right? Using the count function. Always gives us our sample size. The average will give us our sample mean. Okay. So I've got this for the Midwest schools that I had. I'm then going to go over to the South data sheet. And I can do the exact same thing. But I've got a collection of D1 universities that I kind of classified as being in the South, right? Uh, maybe you would argue, I don't know, South Carolina, maybe you don't put it in the South. But let's just, you know, for the sake of, of argument, assume all these are classified as being in the South. I then have the total undergraduates at these universities. So I could find the sample mean for undergraduates at these Southern schools. I could also do kind of my sample size using that count function. And then here's something I don't think we've really done before. So I'll show you how to do this in Excel. It usually makes it easier if I've got two data sets. So in all these examples, right, we're comparing two sample means. So it's probably going to be that we have two data sets, maybe on different worksheets. It could all be in the same file, but then we'd have to use like count if and you know average ifs, and we're not going to kind of dive into those. 
So I'm always going to give you the two groups as two separate sheets. So here I've got the sample mean, but I already have it calculated. So if I put an equals to sign, notice if I then switch sheets, I can see what's in the formula bar up there. It says, okay, go to the Midwest sheet and look at what's in M4. So if I select kind of where that Midwest sample mean was, now I hit enter, it'll send me back there and it's gonna put that Midwest sample mean in. I could also then go equals Midwest sample size, hit enter. Now I've got kind of the sample sizes I had from two, the two areas, the sample means, and then somehow I have these known population variances that would have had to be given to me, okay? So from here, we could build confidence intervals and do hypothesis testing, right? So in this one, oh, let me see, what did I have here? Make sure that I line up with, okay, so this is for the proportion. We won't deal with this until probably Wednesday, right? But for here, we're gonna build the confidence interval for what the true difference is between the enrollment at Southern and Midwestern kind of, kind of schools. So I think uh, actually I'm writing Midwest and, and Southern. So I'm guessing here, I wanted group one to be the Midwest, group two to be the South, okay? So let's see here, there we go. So I'm thinking about this difference is going to be, of the Midwest minus the South. Okay. Well, we had a confidence interval equation, which was take the difference between the two groups. So here I'll kind of write this as Midwest and South. Add and subtract a certain number of standard deviations depending on the alpha that I want or depending on the confidence level I want. And then here I multiplied by, just like in every other confidence interval, the standard deviation of whatever statistic I'm interested in is, well, here I'm interested in the difference in these sample means. So this becomes the square root of each group's population variance over that group's sample size. Okay. So I'm just going to use Excel to be a calculator here. Um, you can, I saw some people try to do this on the third Excel. So there is an equation that you can use that tries to come up with your margin of error, right? Oops, All right? So that's gonna be, I think it's confidence dot N. I didn't show you how to use that because I generally like to kind of break it down the steps because we're gonna need to use the function or the formula that finds this number of standard deviations the way we need to go for other things in hypothesis assessing. So I'd rather kind of have you get familiar using that norm.s.dist function as opposed to kind of black boxing it here. Also, this will create some kind of issues for us um, if we're looking at population, known population variances versus sample variances um, or proportions versus sample mean examples. So I generally just kind of, let's try to think about how we would line this up with how we would do it by hand. So if you do use this, if you use it correctly, you can end up giving people credit for that. Although a lot of times when people use this, it's a little bit incorrect, right? And it's probably a little bit, um, let's say easier. Um, you can see what's going on more if you're kind of trying to use Excel to be a calculator, just like and kind of mimic how you would do this by hand. So if we go here, the first thing that we're gonna do is simply just use Excel to find that Z value, right? So we use that norm.s.inv, okay? Because we know the area we want each side of our confidence interval. Right, alpha was the total area outside the interval. So we had alpha over two on each side. So I said alpha divided by two here. And then we had one more thing, which is if we hit enter here, because we're looking at just kind of the left side, we're always gonna to be told that negative Z value. But when it comes to building these confidence intervals, we've kind of already got the positive and negative built in. So just to make this easier, a lot of the times, I just kind of do the absolute value here, okay? That way, we get the number of standard deviations above we want to go to get our upper bound and the number of standard deviations below we are subtracting this value to get our lower bound. Any questions over anything kind of up to this, this point? Okay with this? All right. So we see kind of the difference in our sample means is positive here. So that's what we're going to build our confidence in a little around. So I'm going to take the mid, oops, what did I forget? An equal sign. I'm going to take the Midwest sample mean. 
subtract the southwest sample mean. That's what I'm building my confidence interval around. I'm then going to subtract the number of standard deviations away I want to go to build the 90% confidence interval. Okay. And then here, I'm just gonna use Excel to be my calculator. I'm gonna multiply that by the standard deviation of the difference in my sample means. Now I haven't calculated this yet. And if I wanted to, I could enter all of this in, in the same line if I wanted to. I'm gonna do it step by step and show you how you do it that way. So this standard deviation of the difference in my sample means, I'm gonna actually calculate that up here. Now, I haven't done that yet. So I won't get a value here yet that makes sense, all right? But I could go up into the cell and say, okay, I want the standard deviation of the difference in my sample means, which I know is just the square root of each group's variance divided by its sample size. Okay. So I'll do square root. I'll take the South variance divided by, oops, it's gonna hide that. So what, M6, be the cell that that's in. And then add to that, well, I should have done this down the line here. I want you guys to be able to see this a little better. So I'm going to take all of this and just move it down one. Yeah, sure. That works. So this way, hopefully, we can see everything that I'm typing. All right. Oh, uh, and I'll move this down one. So the square root of the South's population variance divided by their sample size. And add to that the Midwest sample variance divided by the Midwest's sample size. Okay. So I'm just breaking this down into parts, making it a little bit easier. This is kind of like I said, if we're doing this by hand, doing it this way too, it makes it a lot easier to enter into our calculator. Okay. So now let's make sure my cell references are correct. So this one I moved, so I don't want this to be here anymore. I want it to be right there, all right, where I had that standard deviation of the difference in my sample means, okay? So this should give me my lower bound, right? Now, when I copy this down, I'm gonna want everything to change. Like once I have my new Z values in here, I wanna update that number of standard deviations the way I wanna go, right, or that Z value, but everything else, right? I still have the same sample means. I still have that same standard deviation of the difference in my sample means. So I'm going to highlight this, hit Command T or F4, if I don't have a Mac and freeze those cell references. Now, when I copy this down, the only thing that's gonna update is that Z value, right? This cell reference I have in purple. Okay. So I'll hit enter. I'm gonna copy this down. This should kind of update that alpha. So I'm finding the Z value or the number of standard deviations the way I need to go for the 99% confidence level. And then I can drag this lower bound equation down and it's kind of updating right? Keeping that standard deviation of my sample means and the sample means themselves the same, but allowing that Z value to update. Yeah. Yep. So all we're doing there, right, is basically using this norm.s.inv function, just like we would kind of the, the standard normal table if we were working in reverse, where we know the area that we want in the tail, which is alpha over two, and then we want to go over and up to kind of find the, the row and column heading to see what Z score would correspond to having that area alpha over two in the tail. Okay. Any other questions at this point before I keep moving here? Okay, so we said one way I can get my lower bound is I know I want this exact same equation. So I'm gonna copy this, hit enter, then go back into the cell and paste it. So I was just using the shorthand keys there, I think control C, control V. Um, the only thing that I need to change is I'm adding my margin of error instead of subtracting it. Okay. So if I hit enter there and copy this down, now I've got my 90, 95 and 99% confidence levels. Okay. Now this is for the difference in the South and Midwest. So notice here, even at the 99% level, what could I say with 99% certainty? So remember, we're building a confidence interval for where the true difference is between the average enrollment 
at Southern school or sorry, Midwestern schools versus Southern schools, right? So at the 99% level, what can I say is true about the relationship between enrollment at, in Midwest schools versus the average enrollment in Southern schools? No? So let's think about what we're doing here. There was my lower bound and my upper bound at the 99% level. Remember, we're basing this around whatever sample difference we saw between the Midwest and the South, so that we're saying the true difference between the mean enrollment at Midwestern schools and mean enrollment at Southern schools is somewhere in this range of values. So what's true about all these values? They are all positive. So with 99% certainty, I can say that that difference is, even at the worst, right, positive 54. So even if it was the lowest possible difference here, I could still say that on average, Midwestern schools have greater enrollments than Southern schools, right? Or think about it this way, right? If I've got, that I know that this is positive with 99% certainty, I just do a little bit of algebra here, add that mean from the south of both sides. With 99% certainty, I can say Midwestern schools have a higher enrollment. Okay. Any questions over this, how, I, how I can say this? Okay. So anytime you have all of your values be either positive or negative, you can start to make statements like this, that you know that that true difference is greater than or less than zero, which implies you know that whatever your group one, right, if they're all positive, group one must have a higher mean than group two. If instead they were negative, you would say that kind of group one had a lower mean than group two. Now here, one thing that's kind of nice if I'm doing this, it, you know, when it comes to a problem where you're, you're given potential answers, it matters that you get the ordering correct here. But in terms of in practice, if I had set this up and I had switched this so that the difference read, um, you know, maybe I had, I had done it this way. Everything's going to be exactly the same. It's just that these are going to be negative, right? In which case I should plot them the, the other way. But if I know that this difference is less than zero, well, that's really telling me the same thing, that Midwestern schools must have a greater enrollment than Southern schools. So it doesn't matter what order I set it up in, in it'll lead me to the same conclusions, right? Now, like I said, when it comes to like a problem on an exam or something, right, the order matters in the sense that, you know, the, the answer is gonna look different, right? It'd be the same numbers, but positive versus negative. Um, but at least like, we would get to the same conclusions. Okay. So we've got our three confidence levels. Okay. I could then think about what if I wanted to do some hypothesis testing? Okay. So at first, I will do what I told you I will do, <laughs> um, which is only use, oh, come on. Assume true differences of zero. Okay. So I'll change those, those that had that value of 2000 there. And I'll show you if I wanted to use a value that's not zero, how that would change things. But here I'm gonna say, okay, I want to test for whether or not that difference between Midwest and Southern school enrollments are greater than zero, right? So kind of similar to confidence intervals, our confidence intervals kind of led us to being able to say that the only true differences were positive here. So we can probably guess what's going to happen if I assume that that difference is less than or equal to zero. I find pretty strong evidence that the Midwest is greater than the South. And because my confidence intervals only have positive values, I'm probably going to be rejecting this. But let's work through it just in case I kind of can see, match up those results from the confidence interval to what we would see if we, done, if we had done hypothesis testing. So the very first thing that we can do is try to find my test statistic. So this is basically just going to be using Excel to be our calculator. So I had this written down already earlier. All we're going to do is have Excel be our calculator to find this. So what's in our numerator? Well, we're gonna be taking the Midwest's mean minus the South's sample mean, right? 
We'll then divide that by, now notice here, if I was doing the, if I hadn't done the confidence intervals already, I would enter all of this in, right? Take the square root, select the population variance over the sample size from both groups. But notice what's in my denominator for the test statistic here. That's just the standard deviation of the difference in my sample means, right? I'll blow this up, right? So I found that difference in sample means. Now I just need to divide by the standard deviation of the difference in my sample means. But notice, I actually had already found that for my confidence intervals, right? That's what I was multiplying by here, right? The number of standard deviations away I wanted to go. So number of standard deviations multiplied by whatever the value of the actual standard deviation is. So if I've set it up this way and I've broken it down into parts, I can just select that cell, right? That's what I was dividing by in my test statistic equation. So I can kind of like double dip, right? The work I had done for the confidence interval, I can reuse for part of my, sorry, for part of my hypothesis test, okay? So here, this will give me my test statistic. Now I said earlier, if we're using these assumed true differences of zero, what should always be true is that when I'm thinking about the distribution of the difference in my sample means, if I've assumed that difference is zero, right? If I see a positive sample difference, which I definitely did here, right? It looks like it's about 4,000, right? Then if my sample difference right, is positive, when I go to change this into a Z value or determine what my test statistic is, my Z statistic here coming from a standard normal distribution, that this should also be positive. So sure enough, I'm go back to Excel, I'm gonna hit enter and I get a positive test statistic of 2.61, about. Now, once again, I have a right tail test here. So if I want the P value, that's gonna be the area to the right of my test statistic. So how would I find that in Excel? What function could I use here? Norm.s.inv is where I looked up the area in the tail to find the Z value I want. Well, now I know the Z value. I wanna find the area in the tail. So what equation would I use in Excel there? No, no one remembers there. So we kind of had two, right? Norm.s.inv is when I know the area in the tail, I want to look up the Z value. Norm.s.dist is when I know the Z value and I want to find the area in the tail. So here we had to say comma one to make it cumulative. So just like the tables in Excel, that norm.s.dist always tells us the area to the left. But if I know it's going to give me the area to the left, and I wanted the area to the right, what could I do here? Yeah, simply subtract that from one. Now, if I hit enter, I should get that area that's in the, to the right of my test statistic of 2.6, okay? So just looking at this, what levels can I reject at? The p-value is 0 0.004, and I'm looking at my kind of three benchmark alphas. I can reject at, so we said earlier, I reject if what? P value is less than alpha. This P value is gonna be less than all of these. So one thing you could do, and I wouldn't expect you to necessarily use this in Excel, but it's kind of nice and handy, is use the if statement. So you could just compare it like using your eyeballs, right? To see if it's less than 0 0.1, 0 0.05, or 0 0.01. Or we could use this thing in Excel called an if statement, right? So what this if statement does is you check to see if something's true, comma, if that is true, tell Excel what you wanna put in the cell, comma, if that thing wasn't true, what do you wanna put in the cell? So here, it's kind of nice for rejection decisions because I could say, well, if my p-value is less than alpha, comma, I know I should be rejecting. So if I wanted to put a word in this cell, I have to put it in quotations. But basically this is saying, if the p-value 
is less than alpha, comma, put the word reject. Comma, if it's not, then maybe I want to put in the words fail to reject here, right? That way, even if I change things around up above, right, maybe I don't want to use the assumed true difference of zero. I want to use some other one. It'll update everything and update my rejection decisions without me having to manually compare that p-value to alpha. Okay? Now, one problem with this is going to be, if I want to use this and copy it down so I can get my rejection decisions for different alphas, what's one thing that I don't want to update here? I'm always using the same p-value. It's only alpha that's changing. So I'll freeze that p-value reference. Right? Now, when I copy this down, hopefully it lines up with what we said, right? When we just compare these other eyes, which is that we reject it all. Okay? And I'll show you what happens if, if you know, we change this value here in a second. Okay? I could also find my critical values using Excel. This is really just gonna be okay. I know that my critical values, we actually, had one similar before, right? It's just gonna be these cutoff Z values that give me these different alphas in my right tail. Now, one thing that's a little bit tricky is when I'm using, just like I did for confidence intervals, I know that I want alpha in my tail here. However, the area I tell Excel in this norm.s to INV is always the area in the, to the left. So here, I want alpha in the right. So instead of looking up alpha, I actually need to look up one minus alpha, which is the area to the left for a right tail test. So one minus alpha, right? That's the area that I want to the left of this critical value because the area I wanted to the right was 0.1. So now they hit enter here. Sure enough, it gives me that approximately 1.282. Now, Excel can be a little more precise even than I was before, right? Notice we had to round to the third decimal here, so I can be even more precise than Excel. And now once I have that entered in once, if I've got my alphas kind of lined up like this, I just copy down and I've got my three critical values, okay? Any questions on this? I'm gonna see a cell again or why I did something the way I did. Okay, so a couple things here. Um, what if I had a two-tailed test? What's the only thing that would change in this process? All right, so remember for a two-tailed test, if I saw this as my sample statistic, my Z statistic, every value here, it would have been equally as likely for me to see something on the other side that also would have went against my null hypothesis. Now for a one-tailed test, I was only concerned with one side. So if I looked at the area on the other side, it didn't matter. That actually supported the null. So the only difference to find the p-value for a two-tailed test here would be what? Yeah, someone said it, right? I would need to take that area to the right of my test statistic I've got the same area on the left, so I would then, right, take whatever that area is and multiply it by two. Okay. So that's going to basically double my p-value. I think I mentioned kind of towards the exam and that we kind of start talking a little bit more about it, but two-tailed tests basically make it harder to reject the null because it's going to make my p-value twice as large because now I have areas on either side that I'm concerned with. Notice here, if instead this was a two-tailed test, right? My p-value is a little bit higher. Now we still reject at every level, but 0 0.008 is getting a lot closer to not being able to reject at the alpha 0 0.01 than when it was just a one-tailed test and it was 0 0.004, okay? Any other questions on this? So I will only give you in Excel and on the exam and things, the assumed true difference of zero. Right? I, I, but I wanna show you because in practice, you don't have to use that, right? So here what that's saying is, is the Midwest greater than the Southern in Roma uh, the, on average, right? The average Midwest greater than the average Southern. Well, maybe I say, well, what if I wanted to test for, is the difference between those two areas greater than, let's say a thousand. So not just does the Midwest have 
more on average enrolled at each university, but does it have more than a thousand, right? And so if I go in here, I'll change this to a thousand as well. Whoops, not 10,000. Nope. There we go. All right. Well, here, oh, not sorry, not there. Here. I had to kind of ignore the assumed true difference before because it was just zero. But really, what should be in that equation, if we go back to, let's see, here we go. I also should be subtracting that assumed true difference. It's just that before it was zero, so I wasn't really worrying about it. So now here I'll do minus the cell that has the assumed true difference in it. So now instead of subtracting zero, I should be using that new assumed true difference, which is a thousand. So can I say that Midwestern schools on average have more than a thousand students than Southern schools, right? So I hit enter, my test statistic, a little bit smaller, my p value is a little bit higher. And I can say, that Midwest schools have more than on average than a thousand students in Southern schools with 90 and 95% certainty, but not quite with 99, right? So notice because I had all my cell references, I was always comparing that new p-value to the alpha, my rejection decisions changed automatically as well. And I could kind of do this for different values. So then maybe I want to test, you know, um, I don't know, can I say, oh, also notice if I just put zero back in there, goes back to what it was before, right? Because subtracting zero is assumed true difference. But I could do values like 2,000. At 2,000, I, I can't say that a Midwestern average has more than 2,000 students, right? I actually fail to reject the null at every single level there. Okay? But I could play around with these different, different assumed true values and come up with my rejection decisions at all three levels fairly quickly. Okay? All right, so I will likely this afternoon get up the next Connect assignment um, I'll probably put the next Excel up there as well. I mean, we're going to be kind of piecing that together. Um, so you can kind of start working on those assignments, but like we've got three kind of four different types of problems we're going to be looking at throughout like the next week and a half. So you won't have everything you need to finish those, but you can at least kind of start in them, work on them as we kind of cover material throughout the week. Okay. Any questions for get out of here. All right. I'll see you guys on Wednesday.